let me start right away by asking you a very direct question. And the question is, do you have good taste? Do you believe you have good taste? So if you believe you have good taste, raise your hand. You don't? Not sure. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we, we're, we're into photography, right? So uh, how can we possibly be into any kind of artistic endeavor if we don't have good taste? I mean, having good taste basically just means being able to tell a beautiful picture from an ugly picture. That, that's what it means. So I, I believe you, I believe you do you do have good taste. I believe we do all have good taste up to, to a certain extent. Some people also have excellent taste. So the, we, don't, we all have good taste, I do believe. But that's exactly where the problem lies. Because we have good taste, we can tell that what we are creating is not as good as it could be. It's like there's a, as a, no famous radio show host Ira Glass said, it's like there's a gap. There's a gap between where you are now, what you are making now, and the artist that you think you could be, that you know you could be. Right? Your taste is excellent, and it's telling you that what you're making is not great. So there's this gap. And uh, this is causing frustration, because you're on this side of the gap, and you don't see how to cross the gap. And if you, you know that if you were able to cross the, that chasm to bridge that gap, your life would be better. So if you believe me, I'm going to promise you that if you follow what I'm saying today, and you're going to be a very small group, so we'll have an enormous adva advantage over everybody else <laughs> who is not able to listen to this, uh, you will live a better life as an artist, as a photographer, a more contented life, because uh, your taste will match what you're creating. And uh, it, also I want to say that um, everybody goes through this stage of perceiving this gap, the existence of this gap, and having a taste that tells them that what they're creating is not good enough. So it's normal. You should not be afraid of this. You should also be uh, aware that in order to bridge this gap, uh, you need to change your mindset a little bit, or a, li or a bit more than a little bit. So today I'm going to uh, give you some tips and suggestions on how to bridge this gap. Now, the first thing that um, I want to tell you is that I've been studying this topic for, for some time. And in order to systematize my thoughts and kind of come to the conclusion that uh, there are four categories of things that obstacles, roadblocks, the standing in the way of us crossing the chasm. Right? So I started categorizing them. And I'm going to give you, for each one of them, I'm going to give you maybe one or two suggestions on how you can overcome those obstacles. Uh, and those obstacles all have to do with the relationship between us and uh, something else. Uh, one of those obstacles is your mindset. Or what I mean by this is the relationship you have with yourself. How you perceive yourself. If you don't change the way you perceive yourself, you will never be able to bridge that gap. Uh, second one is your community. I mean in the community of your peers. Other photographers, be they professional, amateur, doesn't matter. But we all do relate in some way with other photographers. We do even more so today, where we are all on social media, more or less. We all are on Facebook, we are on Instagram, we are in communities, there are forums, Facebook groups about photography and so on. So that relationship uh, is very important. And if not managed properly, it risks uh, creating us problem, create this, creating friction, creating frustration. Uh, third obstacle is your audience and possibly your market. Uh, we all have an audience. Even if we are not professional, we don't intend to make any money from our photography, uh, we, still, uh, we all like to be appreciated for what we do. Even if our audience is just our family, our close circle of friends, we don't show our photos to anyone else, still we want to be appreciated by them. 
So how we relate to them uh, is also very important. Your audience can also become your market. If you're a professional, you're trying to sell your photos or any kind of service around photography and so on. And so, on. so how do you uh, create a proper relationship with uh, whoever you want to appreciate your work, whether with a like on Facebook or with money in your pocket? The fourth category, the fourth category is your camera, or meaning more generally the totality of your equipment. Now, of course, hear me well, I'm not saying that you can bridge the gap, you can become a better photographer by buying a better camera. Quite the opposite. In fact, getting a better camera will not advance you one inch toward reaching that goal. Mentioning the camera here because it's the relationship with your camera that sometimes has, is a problem because, you, uh, let's face it, uh, digital cameras nowadays are complicated beasts. My camera here has uh, about 15 buttons and dials and stuff like that, and a menu system that could be the one of the Starship Enterprise, right? It's complicated uh, for people who are not technical. They have thick manuals, you have to study to them. So I see a lot of people struggling with their camera. The camera should become an extension of your hand and your mind. You should not even think about it. Everything should be easy for you. So if you don't establish a proper relationship with your camera, then uh, you will always struggle. But the first category, the first obstacle that you have in front of you is how you perceive yourself. And here is a trap into which I see many people falling. The, the idea of thinking that we have no talent, that we are not good at it, because you know, you're creating something that you perceive is not good, so you might think, well, I'm, I will never amount to anything. This can be something that we, uh, a perception, an idea that we create ourselves, or that other people tell us. Sometimes there are people who tell, well, you, you might take photos all your life, but you will never be a great photographer. And I believe this is a fundamental lie. I don't believe in talent. I believe talent at best is vastly overrated and at worst is a complete fabrication. It's a myth. There is no such thing as innate talent. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And now, of course, I don't expect you to, to believe me and I want to uh, provide some data to support my assertion, right? I'm, I'm doing this with, starting with a story, and uh, it's the story of uh, one of my mentors, Robin Griggswood. Uh, she's a great artist, she's a great photographer, she's also um, a painter, a graphic illustrator, and so on. Well, Robin has this story that she says when, when she was younger, uh, she was told that she had no talent, right? She loved art. She, she knew that art, uh, in particular drawing, was her true calling. But she was, uh, she was the, the right, exactly the people that Ira Glass was talking of. Right? The people who are, have great taste, but are seeing that what they're making is not great. And then people told her that she had no talent, and she started to believe that. So what she did, she pursued a career in a completely different field that had nothing to do with art. However, she always had this uh, lingering feeling in the back of her mind that she was destined to be an artist, not whatever else she was doing. So she kept uh, going in, she kept working, right? As Ira Glass, again, says this, how do you bridge that gap? He says, you do a lot of work. You need to do a lot of work. He's talking specifically about writing stories because he's a writer. So he talks about writing a page, a story every day. Setting yourself a goal. I need to put out a story every, new, every week. Of course, we are photographers. We can put us, set us a goal to take a photo every day or to publish a, a good photo every week or something like that. So one thing is doing the work, of course. Uh, the other thing is studying. That goes without saying. Your, your practice. You should practice. Practice is really important. Scott Kelby said that again the other day, right? I like to keep quoting him. He said, you, you really need to take photos every day. That's essentially it. So doing this, and also what she started doing, she started believing in herself. And so she pursued this career in art as a children's book illustrator. 
And then by doing this, practicing and working at it after years, her work became good. She started being appreciated. So she realized that she did really have talent. But what, where she was at the start, that talent was totally not apparent. She said, uh, looking at my work then, it was obvious, might have been obvious to think that I had no talent. There was an indication of what I could have become. Right? But in the end, she came to the conclusion that everything she does, uh, or nothing of what she does, can be uh, attributed to something innate. This is something that cannot be practiced, learned, and achieved to great success by anyone. And she means literally anyone. So she also says that persistence has been her only talent. So this is Robin Grigswood. Uh, maybe I'll bring another quote here. Eric Kim, who is a street photographer, kind of a contrarian figure. But I think he, he says some really uh, interesting things from time to time, really truthful. And he says, I don't think there is anything such as talent in photography. And nobody jumps out of the, wound, uh, of the womb and suddenly has a skill to shoot photographs. And we need to cultivate our skills through learning, practice, and persistence. Again, same thing. There is no such thing as talent in photography. Still don't believe me? Uh, let's call Albert Einstein, who is somebody who many people would think he was the epitome of talent. He got a Nobel Prize. He revolutionized the world of physics. He was probably a talent since he was born. He was a genius since he was born. But Einstein himself doesn't believe in this. He says that he has no special talent. His only talents were curiosity, obsession, dogged endurance, and self-criticism. Now, these are still isolated voices of people, however authoritative as Albert Einstein might be. So, still don't believe them. I've got the science. There are many studies in psychology that have evaluated the performance of people of great success, be in the arts, literature, in sports even, in, uh, in business, whatever. And the conclusion is uh, unequivocally the same. There is no, th there are differences between the top performers and the normal people. But none of those differences are immutable and due to innate talent. The differences reflect a lifelong period of de deliberate effort to improve performance in a specific domain. Now, to be true for things like uh, athletes, now, of course, if you're not seven feet tall, it's hard to be a center in the NBA. So, so some things are determined by genetics. But if you think about intellectual pursuits, like art, like photography, like writing, nothing is that is really true. There is nothing which is, cannot be achieved uh, and is dependent on, uh, on your DNA. Uh, still, so now that I have convinced you that you have talent and that and you have good taste, one, you have talent, which also lets you put your good taste in practice, and that you need to practice every day to develop your talent into something uh, really good, uh, there is still a, a, a risk here, a danger. And the danger is that you, if you keep practicing in the wrong way, the risk is you keep repeating the same mistakes again and again and again. Right? So you will not progress. You will not bridge the gap. In order to uh, illustrate this, uh, I want to talk about the Helsinki bus station theory. And the person who um, invented this metaphor uh, is a Finnish photographer, Arno Rafael Minkinen. And of course, he being Finnish, he talks about Helsinki bus station. Now we're in Chicago. We'll talk about the Chicago bus station theory. Just a little adaptation of the thing. So, the, so goes the metaphor. There is a bus station in Chicago. And I think there is a Greyhound bus station down uh, West Horizon Street or somewhere like that, right? And in this bus station, there are platforms where the, the buses leave. And each platform has a number at the, at the start. And these numbers identify different routes. So there are numbers 21, 31, 75, 98, and so on and so forth. Every bus, when they go out, it goes out of the station, they, they all follow the same route for a mile. But then those routes start to diverge. Bus 21 goes to Evanston. Bus 95 goes to Peoria. I don't know. Keep, 
help me, give me some other cities in Illinois or nearby states, but you get the idea, right? And of course, every bus stops, has different stops along the route. So the metaphor continues, let's imagine that each stop, each bus stop represents one year in the life of a photographer. So if you, after, if you're at stop number three, you spent three years doing photography more or less seriously. Now, imagine you like to take uh, bird photos. So you go on bus 21, because bus 21 is the bus for bird photographers. And for three years, you take beautiful bird photos. Well, beautiful. Initially, they will not be really beautiful. But after three years, you perceive like you've done something good, and you show your work to I don't know, a gallery curator, a magazine editor, someone like that. They see your work, and they say, well, are you familiar with the work of Scott Bourne? And you say, hmm, kind of. And then what do you think? You think that you're being compared, your work is being compared to them, your work is not original. What do you do? You jump off the bus, you go on a cab, because life is short, and you head back to the station. And now you go on bus 55, and you start taking uh, sports photo. Like you go to the football stadium and you start taking photos of football matches. And after three years, you show your photos to the editor of uh, Sports Illustrated, and they tell you, yeah, they're nice. Are you familiar with the work of Scott Kelby? I'm just naming people who have been here could change this. Uh, and then you say, ah, oh, now what, what do I do? My work is just like him, but it's not as good. And just jump off the bus again, go on a cab, go back to the station, and you take another route. And this goes on all of your artistic life. Always going an, on a different bus, always showing your work after a certain number of years, and always being compared to the work of others. So what's the solution here? Well. The solution is simply to stay on the bus, or to stay on the freaking bus. Why? Well, because it's the difference that, that matters. It's true that what you create initially, you will imitate, you will follow in the footstep of somebody else. But if you keep doing it, after a while, your true vision will take off. Your work will become your own. Your routes will start to differentiate. So for a while, maybe your bus 21 was on the same route as Scott Bourne's bus 35. But then after three stops, Scott Bourne's bus goes in another direction. And you keep going on the same direction. So your work becomes truly your own. And uh, what happens then is that your work starts to be recognized for what it is, for the true vision of somebody who is becoming maybe great. And also, what also happens is that your old work starts to be recognized and re-evaluated as the maybe juvenile work of somebody who was destined to be great. Now, if you, if instead of staying on the bus, you could, for 30 years, you could take 10 different paths, and none of them be true, your true unique vision and calling. And you end up saying a lot of things, but none of them are really meaningful. You can only say a meaningful thing if you stay the course and you stay on the bus. So you should, you should practice, and you should not believe people who tell you that you are, your work has already been done, you're merely imitating the work of other people. Just don't listen to those people. If you like taking bird photos, keep taking bird photos. Of course, if you don't like taking them anymore, you're allowed to change it. But don't change just because people tell you that this has already been done. Everything has already been done. So you might as well stick to it. I also want to talk a little bit more about this topic of imitation, originality, and authenticity. I want to give a quote by film director Jim Jarmusch, who says, nothing is original, that you should steal from anywhere that fuels your imagination or resonates with your inspiration. Authenticity is invaluable, originality is non-existent. And don't bother concealing your theory. Celebrate it if you feel like it. And always remember what Jean-Luc Godard, another film director, said. It's not where you take things from. It doesn't matter which platform you started to. It's where you take them to. So where you end up at the end of this, this route, when, as uh, Minkinen says, the, the bus driver gets off the bus, gets a coffee or a cigarette, and now you're finally your 
the, all of the path of your artistic life is, lies there behind you and hopefully you are a realized artist. So you can imitate other photographers, but I just want to give you a little suggestion uh, that I, I like to follow myself. I like to be inspired also by other forms of art, in particular paintings, the paintings of the masters. And I got a few examples for, for you, just to, to un, uh, show you what I mean. And this is not necessarily something that you should do, but I think it's a, it's a useful suggestion. And I want to start with uh, this one, Claude Monet, uh, the, the facade of the cathedral in Rouen, France. And Monet painted this building many times. I think this painting here has 19 different variations. He painted it under all different conditions of weather, with the sun, and sunrise, sunset, uh, midday, and so on. Uh, always with this uh, impressionist, of course, he was the master of the impressionist. So the, the church, the building is an impression of a building. It's like uh, the, the stone has become pure light and color, like it's shimmering through the uh, air of the afternoon and so on. So uh, I really love uh, Monet's work. Uh, and one day I did my little Monet. I like to call it the Monet Gaudi, because Antoni Gaudi was the architect of the Sagrada Familia Basilica in Barcelona. And I had my little impressionist photo of the Sagrada Familia. And uh, you might think this was created with a lot of Photoshop, Oilify, filter and stuff. No, this is actually straight out of camera, more or less. This is actually a reflection. So it was one morning in front of the church, there is a pond and there was a little wind, so the pond was creating ripples on the wind. And I was shooting the reflection of the church. So this is actually the reflection, and this is why it's a little wavy and blurry. And then I flipped the photo upside down. This was the main post-processing uh, trick, to flip it upside down so that uh, what you see is, upside, is downside up or upside down, as, as you want to put it. And it doesn't look like a reflection anymore, so it's my little impressionist uh, but I like, when, I, when I'm shooting, I like to think of possible uh, paintings that, uh, that would inspire my conception of an image. Uh, another example, Georgia O'Keeffe, American painter. Uh, she lived uh, for a long part of her life in, uh, in the Southwest, in New Mexico, I believe, and she did a lot of paintings of desert scenes uh, like that. Uh, this is not my photo, this is a photo of Guy Tal, a great photographer from Utah. I don't know if he was inspired by George O'Keeffe, but I like to believe that he was, and I'm pretty sure he knows her work. So this is the kind of, I think, O'Keeffean landscape there. Uh, again, George O'Keeffe, kind of more of a surrealist painting. My, uh, it's very dissimilar, but some kind of sky with dark clouds. Uh, again, this is another Gaudi. Uh, this is on the roof of a building in Barcelona, which is ca whose of name is uh, Casa Milà, also called La Pedrera. And this is what taken on the roof. And these objects here, which look like primitive statues of warriors or whatever, are chimneys. But I love their anthropomorphic <laughs> way and their kind of abstract shape against that sky. Uh, this is a photo I took in Italy one afternoon and I like to compare it with uh, some paintings of a uh, metaphysical painter called Giorgio de Chirico. And he has these scenes where there are kind of haunting scenes with exaggerated perspective, stark shadows. His one is even more haunting because he has that shadow possibly of a statue and a little girl with a hoop. So I don't have anything like that. Uh, I found something like that in a photo of another Italian photographer, Alessandro Bizzotto, and the moment I saw this photo, I said, okay, well, this is perfect, the Kirigo. Can I use your photo in a presentation? Because I really love it. So same kind of scene, empty, uh, sunny afternoon with dark shadows, and he also has a kid playing in this time with a bicycle and throwing a shadow, and a distant horizon, empty sky, and so on. Very metaphysical to me. Uh, I also like to imitate things like movie posters. This is a scene in uh, Brooklyn, New York. I turn it to sepia, kind of because what I had in mind was an imitation of a famous movie poster, Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in America. Uh, so just a few, a few ideas for you. Ah, oh, one more, and very quick. Uh, René Magritte, 
the Empire de Lumière, or the Empire of Light in English. Uh, Mar Magritte painted variations of this painting. I've always had in mind to do it. Uh, I was never able, especially because it's, it's pretty impossible to do this as a photograph, because it's a night street scene with a daylight sky. So, well, you can do a composite, of course, uh, but it's pretty hard to do it in real without a composite. Uh, I was not able to do it. I haven't done it yet. I'm actually, wh what I'm actually wanted to do is this. This is the cover of one of my favorite albums of all time, uh, Late for the Sky by Jackson Brown. Obviously inspired, the photo is obviously inspired by Magritte's painting, only they had a very American old car uh, in there. My closest thing that I was able to create it's nothing to do with it, but I uh, just love this photo taken in San Francisco. And uh, I, I swear, the, the red truck, I didn't pay the driver to park it there. I found it there. <laughs> and I said, oh, this is a great scene. I'm going to, to shoot it. And then it reminded me of that album cover. OK, so uh, this is about uh, imitation. And we're still in the realm of what we think of ourselves and how we should uh, relate to ourselves. And another recommendation that I want to give you is to always try to go the extra mile. Always try to do something more. I want to, to illustrate this with a story. And the story is, has been told by the great and late American photographer, Galen Rowell. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. It was one of the first uh, wilderness and ex, uh, he was also a climber, did a lot of work, and uh, he died in 2002. Anyway, he tells this story in one of his books about when he was with a group of photographers in Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. And they had been photographing outside uh, near, the, near Lhasa. And after a long day of photography, there was a thunderstorm around, and uh, there was the, the possibility that, would be, that there would be a rainbow. And actually, a rainbow appeared. So the group of photographers just took photos of the rainbow, but the, it was just the rainbow. I mean, there are millions of rainbows every day in the world. Uh, it's just another rainbow without anything interesting in the foreground. It's not really a compelling photo. And all the, the, the other people, OK, took a snapshot of the rainbow and then go back to the hotel for dinner. But he stayed out. He literally went the extra mile, because he being a great artist, he had pre-visualized pre that if he had moved literally a mile, to a different position, he would have been able to capture the rainbow um, in a specific position, with the risk of getting drenched by rain and skipping dinner. So he went the extra mile, and he captured what he says was one of the greatest photos that he ever took. So with the rainbows ending right on top of the Potala Palace, the former residence of the Dalai Lama. And this is a beautiful photo. And not, it's not only beautiful, it's highly symbolical because of the story of Tibet, the, the invasion of, by China, the strife for independence, and so on, and the symbol of peace on top of such an iconic place. I mean, gives this photo totally another layer of meaning. And he only got it because he was uh, committed to go the extra mile. Uh, I want to tell my, my, my little story. I mean, uh, not many people know, but yeah, I'm a professional photographer, but I also do keep another job. <laughs> And this job brings me across Europe to travel to go to clients. And sometimes, well, well I go to a client in a, in a European city, to their offices. We do meetings the whole day. We, uh, we do project work and so on. So sometimes the only thing that I want to do at the end of a long day of work is to go back to my hotel, take a shower, go to dinner, have a beer, go back to the hotel, maybe watch Facebook, check emails, and go to bed and start again the next day. But I always bring my camera with me when I'm traveling, even if it's not for photography. And I always make a point that even if I'm tired and I want nothing more than just relax, I go out with my camera and try to take some good photos. This is also why many of my best photos are taken during the blue hour, because that's the time when I have <laughs> more opportunity to go out and shoot. So I might go to Frankfurt and take, instead of going to dinner or maybe delaying my dinner, take uh, a photo like this one. Uh, so without, OK, I'm, I'm not pretending to be Galen Rowell in Tibet, but in my little thing. I also want to uh, show this quote by my good friend and travel photographer, Ken Kamineski, who says that you should never regret going the extra mile. Another word, of, another word of saying it is you will never regret the things you did. You will always regret the things you didn't do. 
And it's, if you don't, even if you don't take, take a good photo, this is going to take a great, to give you a great experience. All right, see, this was about your relation with yourself, yourself, your attitude, and how you see yourself and how you, where you want to go. I want to talk now uh, a little bit about uh, your relationship with your audience, with your, uh, sorry, with your community, with your peers. Uh, there would be many things to say, but in the interest of saving time, I'm just going to limit myself to one thing. And, and the thing is this, uh, and again, <laughs> Scott Kelby said this already the other day, in, in his own words, when he talked about Facebook groups and forums, which are the death of photography. But unfortunately, I'm a bit of a uh, glutton for punishment, and I do uh, attend uh, things like Facebook group or photography forums. And when I see a, a lot happen there is that somebody would post a picture without saying anything, maybe, or just a little bit details of where it was taken. And then somebody would comment with a critic, or what they think is a valid critic. Like, well, uh, you didn't expose it properly, the highlights are blown out. Or you didn't respect the rule of thirds, or the photo is not sharp. To which, if I want to really start a flame, I reply saying, uh, what, what, what's the reason why I was saying this? This is no critique has been asked for. You should just don't say anything. To which they invariably reply that they are doing it to because, well, for one thing, why do people post on Facebook? Is it just for getting likes? which my reply is, why do you care? <laughs> it's none of your business. And number two, oh, I'm critiquing here because I'm, I know, we're in this group to all try to grow together by giving us tips and suggestions and critiques and so on. And I say, fine, that might be why you really believe you're doing so. The, the, the truth is that uh, you're not doing this to help somebody else grow. You're doing this to help yourself because so typically, the people who give those critiques are people who have just learned something. They open the book or they watch a YouTube video and they're, oh, there's this thing called the rule of thirds. Cool. I'm going to apply it to all of my photos. And then they see somebody who is not applying the rule of thirds and they say, oh, you're making a mistake. And I learn a little bit, a little thing, and which is now I'm better than that person. And I'm going to point out that their photo is not good because they are not doing the thing that I'm doing. This is very much unconscious. I'm not saying that people consciously think, ah, I'm really going to be mean and say that. But this is very much the unconscious motivation. It's not helping others. It's helping yourself to feel more realized, right? So uh, what's, what's the thing that pushes people to do this kind of behavior and why I'm telling you not to do it? Never criticize the work of others. That's the message I want to give you. That thing might be called the resistance. Is anyone you familiar with the, 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 the book um, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield? Because there is a war inside of us. And he talks about one of the fighters in this war is the, what he calls the resistance. The resistance is that uh, inner force, that nagging voice in the back of our heads that tells us that we are not good enough, that we don't have talent, that we will never amount to anything. So it's worthless to to stay there and put in the work and do a photo every day and practice and study and so on because you will never get better. So you just better give up, go outside, drink a beer, stay on Facebook, go on a, f on a flame war on an on a internet forum. Right? This is what he calls the resistance. And uh, Pressfield says that uh, the resistance has various manifestations. Most of them only hurt ourselves because they it's an obstacle. It's blocking us from bridging the gap. This is sometimes, this is the rest, resistance, or, or it, at least it's the way he decides to call it. And he says that people who are really realized in their art, and I see it, uh, on those forums, if there is somebody who is good, who is a master, who is recognized as a long career, and has started creating meaningful work, they never criticize the work of others. They don't do it. They might do it in a portfolio review. If they're specifically asked for a critique, they might give it. You know, every time I do, they do it, they always say something nice, if, it, if they can find something nice. Another way of saying it is that if you don't have anything to say about something, don't say anything. Just giving a negative comment and it's all is a manifestation of the resistance. It's not hurting ourselves only, it's only hurting others. But it's, hurt, it's definitely hurting ourselves because it's, we are giving in to this resistance. 
right? The resistance is pushing. We are putting in the work every day. We're taking photos, and the resistance is feeling that it's being defeated. So it tries to find a side way to hit us. And this is way to, this might, you, might be one of the ways. We are giving in, and when we're giving in, then we fail, and we he yield to the resistance. Uh, so my first recommendation, as I said, is never criticize the work of others. So let's see this from the side of you are tempted to give somebody else criticism, and I'm saying don't do it because it's hurting yourself and others. But I'm also saying don't listen to the critics, which has to be taken with a grain of salt. It means do not listen to the people that on an internet forum, like a random stranger, is telling you, well, you didn't respect the rule of thirds. Right? Now, of course, it's a different thing if you go on a, on a competition and the judges, it's their job to give you judgment and criticism. But, but you go to the people. Uh, typically, you ask uh, what I do, or suggest that you should do, is you should only ask critique from the people that you know and respect and admire. Because you know that they're capable of giving you good advice. Hopefully. Now, judges on a competition that you don't know and they tell you that your photo is not good enough, well, you just have to take it, in a way. You don't walk away happy, no. Because in that case, I mean, you, you quote unquote failed. Which doesn't mean that your work is not good enough. They it might be them who are wrong. If you feel like your work is still good enough, you, you need to stay on the bus. You need to pursue your vision. Of course, that doesn't mean that your work, just because you're staying on the bus and pursuing your vision, your work is good from the start. It has to get better. So that negative thing, you have to take it and try to extract from it some information that will help you see in which respect your work is not good enough. Uh, you're a street photographer. You're not getting close enough to people, for, instance, for example. I see it all the time. Sometimes people ask me, what do you think? I, I had a person who was here last year. And after last year's conference, she sent me to her site. And she had some photos of people she had taken in the street. And all of them were taken from the back. They only had she only had photos of the, the neck of people. Not a single face. And I said, well, I see you're, you're trying. But it's obvious that you are not putting it the, you're not even trying to go in front of these people. Maybe try to capture an expression, a gesture, and so on. You're afraid, and you stay behind them so they cannot see you, right? So I met her today, and she told me, your, your words opened me a world of possibilities, because I realized I was actually doing that. And now I've gone past that. So that, that's something that you have to consider. And, uh, uh, but, but of course, I, I did not just say, no, your, your photos suck, because you're just taking photos. I, I'm not Bruce Gilden. If you ever seen Bruce Gilden, the photographer, give a, a portfolio review or a critique, he's cathing. He just says, well, uh, this is, you're, you're not trying hard enough. Come again, come again, come again next year. That's what he says. Right? I'm not like that. And I'm suggesting that you should not be like him. One more thing. How do you relate to, to your audience in this case? And, or to your community, if you prefer. We are a bit in the middle here. And um, my suggestion is to share your knowledge and your work freely, which is a bit what I'm doing today. I'm sharing my knowledge, hopefully, with you, with you, and hopefully it will be useful. And I'm doing this because I love doing it, not because of the money that the conference organizers pay me. Trust me, it's not a lot of money. And so, uh, because I love coming to Chicago, I love interacting to people. So this is something that that you should do. But because I see a lot of photographers, and I see this in a lot of other fields, they are hoarding information. They are collecting knowledge, and they're never sharing it with others. The reason to do, there are two reasons to do so. One is because I want to explain it again. I love to quote people that inspire me. One of them being Leonard Nimoy, the Mr. Spock of the Star Trek series. Right? He was also a good photographer. He was an amateur, passionate photographer very good photos. And he said this, the miracle is this, the more we share, the more we have. Now, I don't believe in karma, but I still believe that me coming here and sharing things with you through my site, through my blog and everything, I can get more than I give. So this is one reason. Uh, and the other reason is very selfish instead. Because I learned that 
people make business with people they know, they like, and trust. And the only way to gain trust in a field like uh, professional, like photography, uh, especially if, like I'm doing, I'm not just trying to live by selling photos, uh, and is to appear as an expert, to become an expert is in your field. And you don't become an expert if you sell whatever you have to know, because people will just not buy, will not see it. You have to give it away. You have to write, you have to create content, you have to share your knowledge. So this is very selfish, because sometimes I do it in order to achieve a certain status that I, held, that I hope will benefit my business, and I'm very open about saying this. But still, I think it's uh, the right thing to do. Um, another thing that I recommend is that you share your photos freely. Many people will put their photos online. There's a lot of discussion about this. Should I, when I put my photos online, should I put high resolution? Should I watermark them? How do I protect them? Now the internet is full of thieves. They're going to steal my pictures and then you're going to use it on their Instagram feed for their nefarious purposes or whatever. Well, you can, uh, as Trey Radcliffe, which I'm pretty sure everyone knows, and he's certainly a successful photographer, says, is that, well, you, you, you can be like that, right? You can watermark your pictures, put them, up in, put them up in small resolution, and then spend all of your time chasing down the infringers. Or you can be like me. me being like you means putting up your photos in full resolution with no watermark, and in this case, also with a Creative Commons license that says, you're free to take this photo, copy it, and use it, as long as you are using it not for profit, not for commercial purposes. Personal use is okay. You need to attribute the photo to the original author. And if you reshare the photo, you need to share it under the same conditions. So this is what the Creative Commons license says. And he says that by doing this, he got so much business, because people started being able to admire his photos without a, an, ugly, an ugly watermark across it. And they started sharing them. And because of this, he has so much business that he, he sells prints for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Because then the people, he says, most of the people want to do the right thing. Yeah, there are thieves on the internet. Who cares? Yeah? But then the people who want to do the, right, who do the right thing will come to you and will ask to pay for your photos. And you've become popular, and your photos will sell for more. Because let's face it, sometimes it's not how good is a photo is that determines the price, but it's how popular the photographer is. This is like a bonus slide that I added kind of at the, just before coming here. Uh, if you want, I was preparing my presentation and I happened to uh, read a blog post, uh, sorry, a blog post, a Facebook post of all places. Sometimes on Facebook you can find little nuggets of wisdom, of gold. And I found this photo, this post by uh, an Italian photographer, his name is Settimio Beneduzzi. Again, he's also kind of a contrarian. He likes to provoke discussions and, and so on. He has very strong opinions. And uh, the title of the, of the Facebook post was What's Needed to Make Good Photographs? And what he said is that it's not the camera. It's absolutely not the camera. Getting a better camera will not make you a better photographer at all. Photos might be sharper, more megapixels, and so on. They're not better, as in good, more good. It's also not technique. It's also not the skills. Now, don't get, don't get me wrong. The skills are important. And you are here at this conference, and I see that you are a very small group, maybe also because a lot of people went to other sessions to learn about specific skills that my friend Brian, he, uh, here, will enter and said, ah, you're here. Well, I actually wanted to go to the session about lighting. Right? It's, uh, it's perfectly fine to want to learn new skills. And the skills are the base. We cannot create good photos with skills. But it's not the skills sometimes that differentiate bad photos from good photos. Might be the, the things that differentiate taking properly exposed from overexposed or underexposed photos, which can be important, but it's just the base. And again, uh, the other day I was listening to Scott Kelby, and I said, this guy is stealing my... That's why there's nobody here. They, 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 everyone read the abstract of my presentation and said, Scott Kelby already said everything, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the skills are just the base. I'm assuming you have the skills. You have learned them, and it's easy to learn them. You go to Kelby 1, sign up. It's what, what's that, 
$20 a month. And you can see a number of courses and to grow in your skills as you like or go to all the other sessions here, the workshops and everything. You, you can get the skills. And with today's camera, I mean, it's pretty much impossible to get a badly exposed shot. You just have to be really, I mean, dumb. You put it on auto and you press the shutter and the photo is properly exposed 99.99% .99 of the time. Right? So it's not what, and everybody can do it, right? Scott Kelby said so. What distinguishes an average photographer from a great photographer is not the ability to take a properly exposed picture. Everybody can do it. A kid can learn how to do it in a, in a day. This is not important. This not helps you get better photographs. I mean, it's important, but it's not um, essential. OK? So what is essential according to Settimio Beneduzzi? Well, one thing is accept yourself. And don't be afraid to show who you are to the others which, in a way, means also relates to, to what we said at the beginning, right? We are what we are, and we do have talent. Also with all our defects, our shortcomings. We should not be afraid. We should not try to be a different persona than we are. And put on a mask of the, for instance, of the realized photographer who is making great work and is famous and so on, if we aren't. We have defects, and we should accept them. And we should not be afraid of showing these defects through our photos. Because as somebody said, the camera looks both ways. If we, every time we create a photo, if it is a good photo, it has in it something of our own, of ourselves. If we put on a mask and we pretend to be somebody else, the photo will have in it something fake. And the people will see it. So if you don't accept yourself and you think you have to be somebody else when you take a photo, your photos will not be good. Tip number two is take big risks. Do things that are neither right, necessary, or appropriate. One of the risks could be, well, I don't care if people tell me that I'm imitating the work of Scott Bourne. I will keep doing it. It can be risky, but it can also be great. It can be what Galen Rowell did take the risk, it's a small risk, maybe in this case of getting uh, drenched in rain, but he did something that nobody else had done. So that's uh, suggestion number two. And suggestion number three, which I think is very much tied to, to number two, is to, to avoid trying, do, do not try to get the consensus of everyone. Do nothing to satisfy other people's expectations. Maybe the expectation is that you do not imitate other works because it is considered inappropriate. inappropriate. Well, don't, never mind. Do what you think is right. Don't do something just to satisfy what other people think you should do. So maybe coming back to your example of the contest there, just because the judge says that you should uh, put your subject in, uh, in the line of third or uh, uh, do not crop here or there, I mean, if, we, if everyone just tried to get the consensus, everything would be very uniform, very conformist. So the idea is do not be a conformist. And these are just some of the, the things that I felt I could fit within a one hour uh, time slot. But I could say much more. And I actually want to say much more. And I hope you will appreciate what I've told you here that you will want to, to go more in depth. So I set up this website, and it is my, my plan, my project, my big idea is that I'm, I'm going to expand and develop this into a series of lessons or videos, uh, maybe a book in the future, who knows. Uh, right now it's just a project. There is pretty much nothing up there. It's just a, a little uh, explanation of what I'm going to do, and a little form where you can put your email address, I'm going to only use that email address to let you know when I have something out. My idea is to, at least initially, at least for a limited time, for a limited number of people, to make this available for free. So if you want to follow me on this path and discover more, sign up. And when I have new material, I will tell you, and it will be free.